farming anyway is a way of life. It's not a job, it's a way of life. If you're going to be a farmer, to do, that's how you have to look at it. Um, and organics, definitely. It, you have to, I, from my personal point of view, is you have to work with nature. Of course, within organic farming, there's a whole spectrum. You're getting some organic farmers who just see that not using chemicals is the, is the answer, but they're still using the industrial model of inputs and outputs in their, in their head. And then you get fertility, that you have to start seeing the farm as a whole and there has to be a balance there. And that is one of the main principles of a biodynamic farm, that behind this concept you have that it, it has to be not bringing in inputs from outside, that you see that the whole farm is a kind of whole which has to be in balance, that you have to be able to produce all the feed for your animals off that farm, that they in turn will, if you have the right balance of animals, will produce enough manures of different sorts to maintain and, and increase the fertility on the farm. The important for in biodynamics is to have the farm as an organism, so, so the farm is able to produce all its own manure and it's able to produce its own fertility. What people do here, uh, which is much more efficient of course, is then to use the clover to feed it to your ruminants, to your cattle, to your sheep, you know, to your cows, um, and they in return give you manure. It's very important that we all try and go as organic as possible for the health of everyone and I think to try and reduce the amount of chemicals that we're using because firstly if it's the food is not organic you're eating a lot of chemicals anyway and then there's lots of chemicals used to grow that food so if you can go organic then it would reduce the damage to the environment that these chemical GMO crops cause. And then the uh on top of that, in uh, biodynamic farming, there is uh, the concept of the preparations, which, which are, I think, enhancing the manure to a way that the manure is able to really support the plant life, uh, uh, for it to support the animals and the people that live on the farm and feed off the farm. So again, you're creating this cycle of health and sustainability by having the cows eating grass that is suitable for them, that is healthy. And then this manure also goes into the vegetable garden, this manure also goes into producing grain and cereals, which then is fed the people through, through the farm shop. If you grow up with organic food, it's a very whole environment that you grow up in, so everything is affecting that food. And I think that makes you very aware of your environment and what you're bringing in and what you're putting out. So I think to learn to grow organically is um, vital for how you treat the earth, actually. And I think if you experience the goodness that the organics brings in to your food and to your environment, then you start to see what else needs to be done around you. So yeah, I think it opens your eyes. Our cows are all kept biodynamically, which means that um, you know they're fed with um, hay and silage from our own farm. All, all of their food comes from our own farm, and it's all grown organically. And we use biodynamic preparations. Um, the cows have their horns, which we feel is very important for their digestive systems, which um, is also reflected in the milk, and the milk is more nutritious. Um, and uh, they get to. Um, be outside all through ye the year um, and in the summer months, spring, summer, autumn, they, they're out on grass, eating grass, um, which is the most natural way for a cow and you can really taste in the milk that it is um, sort of fresher, more nutritious than um, uh, a lot of milk which is you know blended from many different farms and which isn't organic. I think the future is definitely for people to see uh, not just organic or uh, production, but uh, small scale, small scale production, which is much more manageable for people and is able to employ more people and empower more people as to where their food comes from and uh, to have healthy food and have a stronger connection with their food. Because uh, with industrial farming, 
we have lost connection with the source of our food and the quality of our food. One person can go to Sue and buy pepper, doesn't matter what time of the year. We are able to import fruit and vegetables from all over the world and we don't think about where our food comes from and how much effort goes into it. But in this farm here, it's a small farm, 200 acre farm, um, the people who, who are fed from this farm, the people who are in touch with this farm, get much more in touch with their food. I eat mainly vegetarian, some fish, and I tend to buy from local farmers markets only. I hardly ever enter a supermarket anymore and eat mainly organic food. Mainly vegetarian? Uh, <laughs> I was vegetarian completely for, it was only two years. Um, but I will eat the meat from this farm or from our sister farm, Tablehurst, because it's biodynamic. I know the people looking after the animals and I know what food they're eating and their, um, their environment that they've grown up in. So as long as I know that, I'm happy to eat the meat. I became vegetarian when I was six, um, so I, I haven't eaten meat in a long time. And um, I think probably if I wasn't already vegetarian, then I would probably eat organic and biodynamic meat. But I don't really have any need for meat now, so I stay vegetarian. I, I was vegetarian as a child, and the whole family was vegetarian. Um, but I, I only eat organic meat, really, or biodynamic. I mean, vegetarian food and organic as well. There are methods which are available which can show that we're not just talking about minerals and pure substance, but there are forces in our food and working in nature. And one of those methods was developed by Pfeiffer when he developed the chromatography. And, uh, and Dr. Kalisko as well with the crystallization method. And uh, by using that method, you can see other than just the chemical constituents of something, but it actually shows completely different picture depending on how alive or dead it is, if there are forces in that or not. And, uh, and these pictures are quite objective and, and, and it's absolutely clear. You can take a dead soil and take a sample from that and one which has been enlivened of that same soil with compost and, and biodynamic methods and it creates a completely different picture. Each farm is a, a small community of friends and not only colleagues. For being interested in organic agriculture and what the farm does here is um, to do with the fact that you can involve the community in it and also when you work with biodynamic agriculture or organic agriculture you're actually producing food that people can trust. So after I became more interested in organic food and, and growing my own food and cooking my own food, I, I got also interested in what isn't organic or the conventional and, and the use of GMOs. And me personally, I'm completely against using GMOs when you're cooking or, or eating or, or anywhere because they unfortunately are everywhere. The plant is genetically modified. It's missing a vital part of the life of the plant. And when you consume that, you're also missing that vital part of life. Yeah, I personally don't believe or believe in GMOs because of the health benefits of health for people and for the for the planet as a whole. I don't think the that gene splicing is is an advantage. I haven't seen proof of it getting better yields. The only potential downsides, I think, and this, which is why I avoid it, is that it'll have an effect on us. GMO food, I think, is a limiting food source. Uh, it limits your diet, it limits the variety you can eat, and it makes you very dependent on the seed companies that produce this GMO seed. Uh, you can't save the seed, you can't grow next year from the same seed, so for me that raises questions about how good it is for you if, it, if it's not fertile enough to produce its own seed that is viable, then to eat food like that, I don't know how good that is for your body. It's got a terminator gene in it, which means that the, 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 
the plant is not able to produce seeds for the next generation, how does that affect also on a, on a material level, on a nutrient level? Maybe there is nothing there. It's the same as organic or biodynamic soya. But uh, for me, from a quality point of view, I ask the question, how does it affect my, fer my own fertility if I'm eating food that is not able to carry its offspring, is not able to produce uh, the next generation? It's, got, it's not, not just only not able to, it's got a gene that, that is a terminator, that kills it. The, the risk of uh, cross-contamination, not only from one plant to the other, but from one plant to bacteria, to other organisms, and so on and so on, it's uh, you don't know what you're unleashing, you have no idea, but what one thing is absolutely sure, whatever you do, it's completely irreversible. You will never be able to stop it again. Once it's out there, it will be out there. If it's working out in a bad way, there's no way to reverse this process. I'm very suspicious of GMOs. Um, I have to say, I always try to buy from local farms when I don't get my food from my own farm. Um, and then I know I can trust the food. I know that I can talk to the farmers and see how it was made um, and you know understand the attitude of the people who made it. So that's really important to me. Um, GMOs um, have clearly, you know, they've, it, historically they've been associated with using pesticides, they've been associated with, um, uh, you know, infertility of seeds um, and things like that, um, and exploitation of farmers, so um, personally I stay clear of them as much as I can, but um, also, um, in the UK, as well as in a lot of countries, sometimes unless you are buying organic, it's impossible to know because they don't label that something has got GMOs in it. So um, that makes it very hard to always be certain. And uh, the last thing is that it, you know, now time and time again, it proves that GMO doesn't work. Again, it's the question of sustainability. Uh, the fact that I sown maybe a field of, of GMO uh, corn and it's grown a good crop one year, it doesn't mean that it will grow food every year. A lot of GMO crops have proved to fail. They don't have higher yields but they, and they still need to uh, have pesticides, herbicides and fungicides. And the result of it is then you get resistant strains like the super weeds like, uh, and, and this just becomes a um, it just becomes an accelerating process. So if you get super weeds, then you need to use more poisons and more poisons, and then you need the weeds get stronger and stronger, and you're not really solving the problem. The problem is not really solved. While if you create a balanced ecological system and acknowledge the fact that there will be weeds, that there will be pests, that there will be diseases, but to keep it in a, in a balanced way, I think it's much more healthier. The slightest interest in going back to growing your own food or... Um, buying from local growers you should try and do it because um, to me that is the future basically um, when you live in a city and you live just with technology all around you where life is so very so fast-paced you actually gradually completely lose your identity and you completely lose a sense of what life really is about so for me the journey of returning back to nature and to working with the soil and with plants every day has just been an amazing journey like I have had so many moments in the last year or a year and a half where I felt so content and so connected and where I've really been able to feel joy um, just being with color with yeah, sounds of nature. There's so much more than just nutrition that you get from living on the land and working with the land every day. So if you have a chance, then I would say try and leave that bubble where you're completely blinded and numbed <laughs> by technology and just try and go back to nature wherever you can find it, really. It's, I think it's, it's the only way forward. Small scale uh, growing. A lot of small farms that are able to grow and specialize in certain things, and, but grow also a wide variety of fruit and vegetables. It's also fun, you know. It is. <laughs> I wouldn't choose it if it wasn't. 
I really enjoy farming life. I like, it's very seasonal, it's very rhythmic. Um, you always have the most amazing food right at your fingertips. So I would definitely recommend everyone get into farming, but it is really hard work. Um, and obviously if you're doing farming, then do organic farming because it's so much more rewarding. So if you are a young person living in a city and you have a desire to find out what it's all about, you just need to go onto websites like um, the Woof websites or HelpX or there are so many resources on the internet now that can allow you to go and stay on organic farms in your own country even, you don't have to travel around the world but that you can go and stay at places like that um, and get an experience volunteering for a few months um, or even for a few weeks um, that would be a, a great thing to do or alternatively try and find in your own city if there are allotments available, community projects, community allotments, uh, like here in the UK we have quite a lot of those projects and even while I was still working in an office I used to go and volunteer on Sunday afternoons. Try and find some of these projects and help the, allow these projects to help you spark something for you to change your lifestyle and really understand what organics is about just by yeah by eating organically and working with the land Hi, this is Bart from the NoPod Project at NoPod.org. Today we're here at Round Earth Organic Farms with Adam Silverstein. Hi, Adam. Hi, Bart. And Adam's going to take us on a tour of his organic farm and teach us some of the tricks that he uses to grow crops without pesticides or fertilizers. Now, most people, when they keep chickens, they may not even have a chicken coop. But if you do build a chicken coop, you can build a roosting pit and you get all the manure. Ah, very cool. So, 
Ours is kind of fancy, but it doesn't have to be this fancy. Okay. It could be a lot simpler. So there's the roosting pit in there. You can see all the manure that's accumulating there. And that okay. is great fertilizer. So basically, if you look around in this room, that is the only spot the chickens have to sit. Even, well, other than the nesting boxes. But if you look like above the nesting boxes, how we did that slope over there, that's so they can't sit up there. Oh, I see. So they really spend all their time when they're in here sitting over there. Okay. And that's why all the manure accumulates over there. And then there's a trap door or something. There's that... a trap door on the outside of the building. You lift up and you can shovel that manure out. Okay. How long does it take to collect that much? I mean, that's like a year. That's a year. Okay. Of manure. It depends on how many chickens you have. and But supposedly they're, they're like 70 to 80% or more of their manure is being dropped right there. Okay. But and... That manure is pretty concentrated. Very concentrated, hot fertilizer. You probably want to let it sit for a while, or compost it before you used it. Okay. Um, and but it, so but you composted that for a year. How much coverage would you get out of that much fertilizer? Well, I mean, usually when I'm spreading it, I'm just spreading like a quarter inch, you know, on the surface of the soil, or 500 pounds per acre. Okay. You know, is a, is a ratio. But it's, you don't really use a whole lot of it. So it goes away. It goes a long way. Let's go around back here and see our trap door. Oh, yeah, trap door. Okay. Bulging. Look. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Looks like they're supposed to be another one. And then they've got a little uh, door that they can get in and out of here, huh? Yeah. They do. They've got their own little run that they can use. And then they probably can't get over the four foot fence out here. No, you know, some of them actually can crawl through the little, like, the, I've seen some of them push through the, the openings. Okay. Um, but no, and they probably could fly over it if they really wanted to, but they're, they're not really that interested in escaping. If you were like in there chasing them and they took off, they could fly over the edge because I haven't clipped their wings or anything to prevent them from flying. Okay. So. And how many chickens do you have? I think I've got 18 right now. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And they eat all of our scraps too. That's one of their big jobs on the farm. All the vegetable scraps. We're processing the veggies. All the scraps go over there and then they just wind up chowing down on those. that thing soon. It's bulging. <laughs> you just bring your tractor over with the bucket to... For the scraps? Or for oh, the... for that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would probably just load it right in the tractor and then, and then go dump it in a pile and mix it up every once in a while. Nice. Yep. What other things do you use for soil amendments? You know, chicken manure is really the big one that I've used and, and I've also hauled in chicken manure from chicken farms around here. Okay. Um, the, the Del Mesa people, they sell this composted chicken manure that I bought like 10 years ago. It's just been sitting in a pile. Um, I also have a lot of deer and elk that come through here in the winter. So they're contributing. You know, you can actually you see the pellets right there. Oh, yeah. Um, so I leave my veggies, my veggie crop standing. By the middle of October, we're kind of done with harvest. And the deer and elk start moving down as the hunters move into the high country. And they come down here and they spend a lot of time just chowing down on the the remnants of the veggies, you know, Yep. and leaving their fertilizer for us. Very nice. So that's part of it. Um, and then I'm kind of a big believer in just sort of taking care of your soil and that if you have healthy soils that most, for the most part, most soils have a lot of the nutrients that the plants need and a lot of times when you have poor growth, it's because plants can't get at the nutrients that they need. Okay. Um, so a lot of times just by working your soils, by tilling them, by irrigating them well, in our case irrigation, um, spreading some manure, um, you'll you'll start to improve the soil over the years of just, just the factor of aerating them, you know, just tilling them, 
growing some kind of a crop, even if you're just growing a cover crop, like a, a crop that's just to improve the soil. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes I'll plant a ryegrass or clover or alfalfa, and then later in the season just mow that down or till that back into the soil. Okay. And that process kind of helps rejuvenate the soils. And so part of what I'm doing is I've got, you know, 15 acres, but I'm maybe growing veggies on five acres. And, and the other acreage each year is, is either fallow, it's unused, or it's got some kind of a cover crop that's growing in it to improve the, so, improve the soils. Um, so, and I, and I sort of have this slow approach. I'm not real big on fertilizers. I kind of feel like the chemical fertilizers tend to pump things up. They increase the amount of water that the plants uptake and the crop gets bigger, but I don't think it necessarily makes it taste better. And I don't think that uh, if, if you're not in a hurry, then you get the same kind of yields without the chemical fertilizers. Um, it just takes a little, maybe a little bit longer for the plants to reach maturity. But I think they're healthier. I think sometimes if your plants are growing too fast, they're weak. Um, so I kind of have this idea that plants, like people, have an immune system and that, that they have a resistance to things like pests. Um, but if they're weak, the pests will have at them. Uh, and you see that, we, I see that in the field because often the ends of my beds, the far ends, are the part where the pests do the most damage. Now part of that is the pressure coming from outside the field, but part of it is that the, the, the ones, the plants that are growing at the ends of the beds are always the weakest because they get trampled as you walk, you know, cut the corners with the tractor, or they don't get weeded as well, or they don't get watered as well because they're at the edge of the irrigation set. So those plants are weaker to begin with, and then that weakness translates into them having more pressure from pests. Huh, well. interesting. I got that from a, one of my teachers who, who was really into the whole immune system and human beings, and, and he kind of had this idea that plants have Im immunities, and when they're weak, they... And you definitely see that as plants start to decline, the pests kind of will move in. Um, you know, the other thing, big thing that we're doing out here for pests really is not monocropping. Um, you know, I do have some crops like corn, maybe we'll have a quarter acre of it. But for the most part, you know, what you see is a little patch of this, a row of that. You see some flowers out in the middle of the field that are, that are mostly just grown for, for the birds that like them. Um, I grow, there's a couple of crops that I grow like dill and cilantro that uh, I will let go to flower and those flowers will attract beneficial insects. Okay. Um, but the big thing about having the diversity is just that you're, um, you're reducing the habitat for the, for the bad insects for, for your pest. So if you have, a, you know, 10 acres of corn and then you have a pest that likes corn, they're just going to flourish in there and go crazy in your corn. But if you just have a little patch and then you have something else and you have something else, that there's different pests that like each dif different crop. So you're sort of giving them less territory to, to move in on. Um, and at least in our climate, a lot of the pests actually, they, they immigrate in each year. They don't overwinter here. So each year they have to come find you. And if you've just got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, it's harder for them to find you. Very um, nice. Yeah. And then, of course, you're also you're, you're putting yourself at less risk in terms of failure. If you have one crop that fails out of 25 crops that you're growing, it's not as much of a problem as if you're just growing two crops and you lose one of them. So that's another way that diversity helps. So it sounds like diversity is a big part of your strategy all the way around. It is, it is. And also for nutrients, for pests, for diseases, soil diseases. Um, so diversity also plays into rotation where you're not growing the same crop in the same land over and over again each year. Um, and when you grow the same crop in the same soils, um, you run into two problems. One is the crop uses the same nutrients and it needs the same fertilizers each year. So it's going to and the second thing is it's going to, the diseases, the diseases do overwinter in our soil. So if you get some kind of a fungus disease that's affecting your tomatoes, and then you keep planting tomatoes in that same soil, you're going to have that same disease. Um, so in that case, we're trying to rotate different plants, and, and we're talking about the different plant families. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes are all in the same plant family. So they'll, they're in the Solanaceae family, and they will all, because they're in the same family, that means they're going to have the same 
nutrients that they need and draw from the soil, they're going to have the same pests, they're going to have the same diseases. So for that reason, those crops, I would never plant them in the same spot in the following year and the subsequent year. That makes so sense. If I had eggplants in a spot the following year, you know, none of those crops could go in. And there's really only like five families of food that we grow for almost all of our food, for, for the vegetables anyway. There's, you know, the Solanaceae, which I just mentioned. There's the Carcubids, which is like uh, cauliflower, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, cucumber, squash, winter squash. Those are all curcubits, pumpkins. There's different subspecies, but they're all related. They all have the same pests, same diseases, same nutrient needs. Then there's the Cruciferciae, which is like the, or brassica, brassicas, they're called broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage. All those are in that same family. Um, let's see. What other vegetable crops are there? There's the alliums, which is like the onions, the uh, garlic, um, shallots, leeks, all those other oniony things. Stronger smelling root crops. Yeah, and that was three plant families. I'm, I'm, I'm probably forgetting. Okay, so the lettuces are all in one plant family, but I can't remember what the name of that family is. Um, I'll have to go look. I've got a book that's a little more of a guide that, that would give us like all the information. But but the idea is that each you know there really aren't that many different plant families that we have. I think it's just five that we grow vegetables in, and then each one of those plant families, as you get to know them as a farmer, they, they really are this very similar. You know, broccoli grows very similar to cauliflower. They like the same conditions. They use the same nutrients, same pests, same diseases. So really, that plays into a lot. The diversity is also about rotating and. and having all those things kind of mixing up um, each year. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> no, this is good. This is exactly what we need. Um, you know, the other thing we do for pests is we use these, this remade material. And, you know, that's going to be hard to come by in, in a you know, place where you can't just order stuff through the mail. But that is a, like a fabric probably something they could make very similar but like we have problems with a certain pest that gets on our soft leafed uh, like the tatsoys and the bok choys and stuff it's the flea beetle will just eat those up so we cover those crops with this very thin kind of fabric it's an agricultural fabric called rime and it allows the air and the water and the sunlight to penetrate but it doesn't let the bugs get through okay do you have some of that around we can look yeah, at yeah we can look at a piece of that and we think you know, like, it's very simple something and you have to be a little careful because if you've got fruits in there that need to get pollinated you're keeping your pollinators away too. Okay. Um, so you, you, know, you need to have bees that, that are just really going that you can't keep them covered with fruit. Um, but if you're not worried about if you're just growing a leafy crop where you don't need where there's no fruits, then you don't worry about that. And the beetles don't crawl around the fabric or something. Yeah, I mean like I that. pin it down but these flea beetles actually they they move by hopping. Okay. So they don't really crawl. Huh. Uh, and there's some that get under there anyway and there's some under there before you start. Um, but it's just much, much less. Okay. Yeah. So that's what it sounds like, is that you're never going to eliminate your pests on an organic farm. Right. But doing everything you can to interrupt their life cycle. Yep. Yep. And, you know, people, some people are, you know, we, we have the benefit of, of growing in a desert climate. So we don't really have the kinds of pest pressures that some people have. Um, but like our, our organic fruit tree growers, the apple growers, they have to spray really regularly to keep the coddling moss from moving in. And they're spraying some kind of an oil that has some kind of a plant extract in it that's toxic to those bugs, you know. Okay. And it's organic because it's made with organic source materials, but it's still sort of very intensive. It requires a lot of intervention. Yep. Mostly what I'm doing is doesn't require a lot of intervention. I'm mostly succeeding by the diversity, like I mentioned, and volume, and also choosing to grow here where there's not a lot of pests. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I'll keep walking a little bit. Um, let's see. Do you bring in beneficial insects? You know, I have before, um, but for the most part, I've kind of stopped doing that. 
Um, it's really most effective when, you, when you're in like a greenhouse and you can keep them from flying away. Um, you know, and, and they do sell, like, you can get these bags of ladybugs, and you go and you spread them, and they're, they're ravenous when they come, and, and then you just watch them go to work. But usually a few days later, they're kind of gone. Okay. They kind of move on, unless there's something great about it. And I, most of what I try to do is just, again, create that habitat for them. So, like, I grow these breaks of dill and cilantro, and the, and the ladybugs are drawn to that, and then they'll, they'll go out and find other food. Okay, so dill and cilantro are your big favorites for attracting. They're my big favorites. They're, they're in the Umbrophilarae family. That was one of the family we didn't talk about. The carrots are in that family. Um, what else is in that family? Um, Umbrophilarae. It's, um, and and uh, they make they all make a similar kind of flower. That's It's like an umbrella. That's okay. where um, umbel comes from. And, uh, it, and those flower heads, we can actually, I'll show you something here. Those flower heads are what's very attractive to the beneficial insects. We'll have lace wings on them, lace bugs. That's dill. Okay. That's the classic umble family. So there's quite a few plants that have that same shaped, sometimes they're white, sometimes they're yellow, but they always have that kind of open up in a in a big head like that. These are potatoes here. Okay. And do you plant the dill in with other crops directly? No, it's usually on its own, but what happens is it goes to seed every year. Okay. So every year it kind of just comes up wherever, it, and if I don't weed it out, then it's then it's there. Okay. Um, in this case, I, I specifically left this. Uh, I, I mowed over the tops of most of this potatoes to knock the weeds down, but I didn't mow this because I knew people would want dill for their pickling projects. I see. So, and it was like the only dill I had left in the field. Ah. Nice. That I mean, worked there's, out. There's some more, but these were some big heads at the time. What do we have growing over here? This is uh, cauliflower. This is some of that crazy purple cauliflower. Oh, nice. A couple heads that didn't get picked in there. Yep. Um, that was a green cauliflower we did this year. And we grew the orange cauliflower and, of course, the white cauliflower. Um, that kind of diversity is more just about people enjoying the different colors than... than uh, Okay. They're all in the same plant family. They all have the same needs and everything. Yep. Um, cabbages in here. Uh, you can see our sprinkler line. Things like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower all like water. They like to be watered all day long, every day. So you can water them in the heat of the summer here. You'll always see these uh, sections on. The sprinklers are on here. So that's one other thing that happens that works against the, the diversifying theory is that because of my different irrigation needs, I've got to kind of clump things together that want the same kind of irrigation. Okay. Um, so I'll clump together these breasts because even though ideally maybe they would be more separated. You know, there are, these aren't all the um, brassicas that I have. There's some over there, and there's some out there, so it's not like the whole thing, but there is a big clump of them here, and that's for a reason, because they all like to get watered all the time. And that's probably your most water-intensive type of crop. Mm -hmm. That and like lettuces get watered a lot. Um, whereas something like a tomato or a squash maybe would prefer if you, if you didn't water it as much, likes to dry out really between waterings. Um, at the end of the year, people often will just stop irrigating those crops and just let them dry. Okay. So they'll ripen up their fruits more. I see. This is all sort of fallow, but it was it was planted in crops this year, and then it's just been dug up, and I haven't had a chance to till it down yet. Nice. Got a lot of rocks in our soil. That uh, is always a lot of work on your equipment, and uh, it's a big project in the spring, but the rocks also indicate that we have good mineral content in our soil, because our soils are being formed when there's a lot of volcanic activity in the area. And amazingly enough, if you go down to Hanson Mesa, one mesa below us, there are no rocks. <laughs> no rocks. Like, none. <laughs> like, if they want rocks, they have to come up here and get them. And, uh, you know, around here, you see, uh, you can't quite see them, but there's rock walls on the edge of every field because people have been pulling rocks out for a hundred years and they're not done. You know, they're still more rocks. Um, and so you've got a much better mineral content than maybe you're down in Hanson Mesa. Yes. Their soil is much more sterile and sandier. Yeah. So they have more like to do in terms of fertility than they do. Okay. So but I just no I just noticed the rocks as 
point. <laughs> yep. Because every time you tell, you get a bunch of rocks coming up. Conditions change. You can have things come up that weren't growing there before just because you've changed the conditions. So over over like several years of farming, you'll start to see different types of weeds that you didn't have before, just because they're sort of proliferating in your soil. Okay. And what types of things do you do to deal with weeds? Weeds we really cultivate by hand. It's all done mechanically by hand. I do a little bit of tractor cultivation on my bigger crops like like the corn where I can get the tractor set up and, and tear through there with blades behind my wheels and, and, and get a lot of the weeds that way. But for most of the crops we're weeding by hand. We use a, a, a hand hoe, it's a, like a stirrup blade hoe. Okay. It's like a thin blade and kind of a slightly flattened, uh, it's not completely flat, but it's got like a little bit of a bend to it. And you just use it in this pulling motion towards you. Um, the biggest thing that I've found about weeding is that the timing is really critical. You have to weed before the weeds get too big or you wind up doing a lot more work. Um, and so getting to the weeds at just the right point is really important in terms of being efficient. Uh, also, the moisture level of the soil is really important when you're weeding. So in our climate where it's dry and we can control the moisture level, you know, I try to make sure that the soil that we're we're cultivating, hoeing, um, is not soaking wet because it'll just, the mud will just clog up your tool. You also don't want it to be super, super dry because the soil just gets hard when it's dry. But it's got to be kind of somewhere in between, a little bit of moisture. And then right after we cultivate, we want the weeds that have been cut up to just bake in the sun so we don't want to irrigate for another day or two after we weed. Okay. And then we can start to irrigate again. Um, you know, where you're, where you're in a climate where you're relying on rain, you, you have to really, like, <clears throat> be on top of, okay, like, it, today's the day we've got to weed today because the conditions are right. So the, the weeding is most effective when the conditions are, are perfect. The, the weeds are at the right height, the moisture level's right. Um, so to me, being really successful about weeding is just keeping at it all season, kind of starting early. I start when the weeds are just like tiny, tiny weeds and you can barely see them and we just start. And it's very quick, like you just weed a whole bed in almost no time because there's not much. You don't even see much and it's very quick, but, but still it makes a difference. Um, so I just kind of try to start early and, and stay on top of it. How often do you weed? Well, you know, it's it, it's kind of like a part of our season. Like early in the season, we're, we're doing greenhouse work and field prep work. Then we're getting to planting big time. And usually by the middle of May, we're almost done with our planting and we're really getting into weeding. And then we have a period of about like a month and a half where that's like all we do. Uh, and I hire a crew. I bring people in to help us with weeding because it's a big labor need that we suddenly have. Um, and then it kind of goes on. You know, it's, it kind of trickles in and then it gets really big and then it kind of goes on for almost the rest of the season. It kind of slows down towards the end because we stop weeding certain crops and other crops we have to weed again or maybe, you know, a second or third time. Okay, and what do we have here? These are artichokes. This is the rest of the artichokes. They're really kind of finishing up. Here's the broccoli. Got some wild turkeys out there. I don't know if you can see the turkeys. Oh, yeah. They like to eat the bugs, too. And they don't tromp on the crops too bad, huh? No, we, we did notice some damage in our lettuces this year. But not too much. They, they, they really move quite a bit. They don't, they don't tend to stop and you know, do too much con uh, concentrated damage. And how many turkeys do you have out here? I have no idea. There are several groups. They're wild. Uh, probably 50. Are there any artichokes? Oh yeah, here are a couple on the plant. You can see the ladybugs all over them. Yeah, was I telling you about that? This is a you see, what you see here is really cool. You've got the ladybugs that are eating the aphids. And the other thing you get is, you don't see it so much right now, but you get ants that farm the aphids. The ants, there's an ant, they bring the aphid eggs up and they put them on the plants and then they come back and they harvest the little baby aphids to eat. Okay. Uh, and then the, the ladybugs kind of key in on it and there's a lot of wasps that come in too. And 
I mean, these plants right now, I, don't, it's, I think it's just kind of cooled down, so it's slowed down. But in the middle of the summer, it was just like crazy. You could barely walk in here. It was just insects everywhere. And so ladybugs are pretty much your primary beneficial around here, it seems like. They're a big beneficial for sure. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of them in here. There's a lot. The celery in our climate tends to get really tough. So what I'm trying to do here is hill it up. I'm trying to use a tracker to bury these things with dirt. And then that'll sort of blanch them and make them turn white and tender, hopefully. Nice. I can almost smell the peanut butter and raisins. <laughs> Alright, we're almost at the end here. That's good. Talk a little bit about drip tape. So this whole section here is all being irrigated with this drip tape. And this is like the most efficient way to irrigate. Um, the water's just pushed down into the tube, and there's little holes that are kind of pre-drilled into this seam that allows the water to dribble out. And so for the whole run, there's like a little bit of water dribbling out every 12 inches, and the, the lines stay on for a long time, like five or six hours, until it's saturated. Um, it's very efficient. You're not watering, you know, in between the beds, so I've got one row of crop, and then I've got a five or six foot space, and then another row of crop, and I've just got water going where the crop is. So, also less weeding, because you're not watering your weeds. Um, and also, a lot of these crops, they don't really like the overhead water as much. They really, they don't, they don't like to be watered on their leaves. So anyway, that's drip tape. Um, you know, I mean, just irrigation is just a huge thing out here in the desert, so... I don't know, it just probably doesn't apply to other places where it rains all the time, but for us, you know, that's a big technological innovation. And so you've got some main pipes, and then you keep branching down, branching down, and the drip tape's obviously at the end of the whole mm -hmm. chain. Yeah. Yeah, we have a, um, a really big four-inch main pipe that's buried. And then that comes up into these risers every 40 feet and then on these risers I can either go with a sprinkler line where I'll have a sprinkler head every 30 feet or I can go into a PVC pipe and then go into the drip tapes okay so it goes to PVC up at the other end there no the PVC would be down I could just like this here okay I see. Sprinklers. Gotcha. And then from the PVC it goes into that drip tape. Okay. Do you have one of the drip tapes starting off from the PVC somewhere? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to see it. Okay. That's what it looks like. Wow. And all I really do is I... Looks like that one wasn't working. Um, you know, it's a very simple system. I. I drill a hole in the PVC that's slightly smaller than the outside diameter of this tube. Okay. And I cram the tube in there. And then I poke a hole in the, tu in the t uh, drip tape and cram the tube in there. And that's my, that's all of my whole technology. And then you just pinch off both ends of the drip tape. Yeah, I just hide it in a knot. Okay. They do make special fittings for all this stuff. You know, they make a special fitting for this part. They make a special fitting for tying off the end. They make a special fitting for this. I just learned this kind of cheap way of doing it, where you don't have to have any fittings. If it works, that's what matters. Um, you know, and at a certain point in the season, you don't, you can't check the line anymore. When we first fill it up, we go down, make sure it's not leaking anywhere, make sure there's no tears or whatever. At this point in the season, if I were to make, wanted to make sure it was working, I would basically just go to the other end. And if there was water at the other end, I'd be pretty confident that we water dripping out the whole way. Okay. Corn, very productive. Everyone here loves to eat sweet corn. Would also make great silage 
crop for a cow. You know, the cow would eat the whole thing. And I know that most types of sweet corn for modern farming have been bred so that there's only one ear per really? stalk of corn. That's probably true. Is is that how this corn is? or No, no, this one will produce a couple per. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what variety of corn is this, do you know? It's called delectable. Okay. I mean, it is a hybrid, um, but it's not like genetically modified. It's just a cross mm -hmm. between two types. Um, carrots. Oh, yeah. Some sunflowers. The sunflowers are really uh, just for selling for cut flowers. I've got a nice fall crop of carrots here. And we're just kind of picking at those. They'll go for a couple weeks, a few weeks maybe. A lot of different varieties. Hope some in your light. Yeah, I'm going to try and pull one out here. I know, I see you. You might just pull the top. Here, here you go. Okay. These are the here little guys. These are cute. These are the little, like, thumbelinas. Nice. <laughs> but some of them are bigger. Just the type. Do you have different varieties in here? Yeah, a lot of different varieties. So, this is my, this is my little label. It'll say what the varieties are. Atlas, uh, Danvers, and Nantes. Those are the three varieties in this bag. Okay. So each, each bag's got different varieties. Yellow sun here. Oh, come on. I need the water, and then they'll come out a little easier. Sometimes we, sometimes we have to bring the pitchfork out actually to get these guys out. Nice. Depends on the variety. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. That's a healthy looking carrot. Mm -hmm. Lots of carrots still to be picked. There's some basil and scallions. Okay. There's the rest of the beans. Those were highly productive and we had to just stop picking them because we just kind of ran out of labor. So these are onions. You were showing us one of the onions you just picked here. Yep. This is a and walla I was walla. saying that I plant them from I plant them from little onion transplants. So someone else grows them from seed. They probably start them in the fall. They overwinter them and then when I buy them in the spring for transplanting. They're just tiny little onion shoots. Nice. And this was like 2,000. Okay. And yeah, what is this? Maybe an eighth of an acre or something no, like that? No, not even. No, it would be, um, well, about about 24 beds per acre, and it was just two beds. So like a twelfth of an acre. Okay. Yeah. Get that in. Here we've got a bunch of lettuce. Is there anything tricky about the lettuce? Well, in our climate, um, to keep the lettuce tender through the summer, I plant it over and over and over again. Okay. That's the big secret, is just always having a fresh crop. So I have a lot of land here, so I, I till up a new section and plant a new section of salad about every week in the summer. Okay. Maybe two weeks go by the longest. That's and a good then trick. We'll, we'll harvest the lettuce and then when it's starting to get a little bit too big we're, we're already ready to move on to the next patch. Okay. And so your greenhouse is mainly for starting stuff? Well we've got a few. We've got one greenhouse that's heated and that'll be, we'll fire that up in the end of February, beginning of March and that's for growing our our long season crops like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants that need a really long growing season so we have to start those really early. Okay. Um, then this hoop house and then that hoop house out in the field there are both kind of designed for providing extra heat during the growing season. Um, so certain crops in our climate, such as melons, do not really ripen up very well because it's all cool here in the evenings. Okay. So by having that plastic layer, even though it's open at the end uh, and open on the sides, it will retain a huge amount of heat. Plus, of course, it's much hotter in there during the day.
Okay, so you basically just have two tractors here on the farm. This is a big tractor, full tilling, and a little bit of the cultivating, like I said. And this one is the little cultivating tractor. It's a 49, 1949 Alice Chalmers Model G. Got the engine in the back. Okay. Which is a nice feature so that you can see your crops when you're sitting looking at your crops. And in the front we've got these gooseneck sweep blades. And these are set up to weed the three rows that we grow in our beds. So these blades work the soil, the the wheel and this back are, are kind of rolling along, floating along. Okay. These brackets allow the blades to go to move up and down. I see. And then this is this is cutting into the soil. So the idea is this is just below the surface of the soil. This area here is being left untouched in between those two blades. But but this is being cultivated, this is being cultivated. And so there's three lines that are left, three parallel lines, and those are the where the crops are. Nice. Um, so those three lines would line up with these three markers. So when we're when we're planting, I will mark the fields with these, and that'll give us three furrows. And then we'll drop our transplants that we've grown, like our broccoli transplants or our lettuce transplants, into those three furrows. Okay. And we can come back with the front part and weed it without hitting, you know, if, if you're not hitting one row, you're not hitting the other two rows. Right. Because they're parallel. They're not straight, but they're parallel. Um, and then also with the big tractor, the other thing that I do that we didn't talk about is I do some direct seeding with that. So I've got three seeders that I put on the, on the bar on the back. And I can fill those up with carrot seeds, like I saw out there, or corn, or beets, or it's a whole bunch of different crops that I direct sow. Peas, beans, all those things. I'll dump those seeds in the seeder and then drive down, and then that's putting the seed right below the surface of the soil. Again, the spacing on those three rows would match the spacing of these and the spacing of my cultivators. Okay. So I'm able to go back and do the cultivating. Nice. Mm-hmm. We still cultivate everything by hand, but this allows us to come through very quickly. I can, you know, in a couple of hours, go cultivate a whole acre. And, you know, it's not 100% thorough, but it's a 80, 90% kind of thing. And then come back by hand to finish the job off. Well, it seems like a neat little tractor. That's cool. Let's go see your double digger. Okay. So this is a spader. It has uh, just a series of eight blades. Mine does. They come in different widths. And um, w what happens is the blades make a motion kind of like this. They chop straight down, and then they, they, they kind of loop back. They're making a circular motion. And what happens is they're, they're chopping up the soil. Uh, as you move forward very, very slowly with the tractor, they're slicing off like maybe a half inch or an inch of a, of a trench that you're working. And they go down quite far, 10 or 12 inches, maybe even more. And then, as they make their backward motion, they, they catch the top half of that tilling depth, maybe five or six inches, and they, they fling it backwards against this plate. Okay. And the, the soil, if the moisture content's right, will hit that plate, pulverize, and fall back, making a really nice seed bed on top, just like you get with a rototiller. Now, if it's too dry, it'll be, you know, it won't pulverize if it's too wet it turns it into muddy chunks so the moisture content really is very critical on this implement okay um, but if the conditions are right what you wind up with is you know you wind up with soil that you can stick your arm down to your elbow it's loose down that far um, the bottom half of that tilling depth has been loosened the top half has been actually blended more um, they don't get mixed together you, okay, you keep whereas your, a rototiller would just mix them. Yeah, it mixes them. And part of what you're doing with the, the whole thing I was talking about, like the life of the soil and trying to keep your soils healthy, you know, most of the life of your soil is just in those top couple of inches. That's where all the biological activity, where the oxygen is permeating, the worms are doing their cycling up and down. Um, so when, you, when you're when rototilling or tilling down 8 or 10 inches and you're sort of blending it all up, it's not that you're killing it, but you're losing sort of your concentration of your life. You know, so if you can try to avoid that, it's better. Okay. Um, Good so, tip. Yeah. And it's a great tool, and they, they have come down in price quite a bit since I bought mine, and they're, they're make, they make them in all different sizes, so you can get them even as small as, like, for a closer rotor rototiller. Oh, okay. They have them for, like, a BCS rototiller. The fans here one, but I could never get it... See, it's kind of pulled apart. I could never get its uh, chain to work. I got it. I mean, I used it for several years, 
And then one year I just I spent all this time. I had Jim Harden like manufacture these pieces, these teeth for it for me. And okay. I could never get that. It would work, but then it would get stuck. And I finally gave up on it. So I, I need to actually get a bigger one. This is the one I'm using now. It's, it's pretty small is my main problem with it. You know, I can only hold like three or four buckets worth. So I got to drive out there and drive back. Right. The one driving a lot more. But it's chain driven, so it's more reliable. Right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the old technology works better. Yeah. And then does something, I guess, oh, okay, on the bottom of the uh, bed there, that all moves and moves it to that the back. That thing moves back, yeah, there's like a, as the chain runs, there's like a beater arm somewhere that pushes, yeah, pushes this big wheel around. Okay. Just like one notch at a time, and that turns the chain. And is this all driven from the tires? All driven from the tires. Super old technology. And do you have control over various aspects of it with these levers? Supposedly, although mine is not working that great, so I just basically have on and off. Okay. But supposedly, one of them would control like how much was letting out, and one of them would control how fast it was moving. I see. But for me, it's just kind of either on or off. Yeah, neat piece of equipment. How old would you guess that is? I don't know. The guy I bought it from was like 90 or 80 something, <laughs> you know? Yep. Probably the easiest $500 he ever made. There you go. <laughs> Alright, well that was great Adam. That fun and I'm sure we learned a lot today. So, really appreciate it. Hope sure. to see you next time. Great. Thanks for coming out. Yep. Thank you.